Testing one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Testing one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing, testing one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing two, three, four, five. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing, testing one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Shout out at the nation and take me home. 
Welcome. Welcome to Taylor Street. It's uh, good to be back. Um, it's great to see all you folks here this morning. I want to welcome everyone to our worship service here at Taylor Street. I just hope that you have a, a great uh, reminder of uh, why we're here, uh, why we've come to worship our Lord and Savior. And if you're uh, worshiping with us at home, I offer you a special welcome there. And we're just so thankful that you're able to uh, be with us in that way, even though uh, you can't be here in person. Uh, just want you to know that your every bit uh, is important to this congregation and, and to this worship service sitting at home as you are if you're sitting in the pew. And, and we're just thankful for you and we're thankful for everyone here in Christ's name. Dear Lord, this morning I speak for my brothers and sisters and all that will turn their hand, their minds to you in praise. We all thank you for the comfort we are giving to us in these troubled times.
Let each of us share this comfort with the people we come in contact daily. Help us to bear in mind that you sent your son to earth to die for us. And in times like these, we can be comforted because of your love for us. This morning we ask that you strengthen our thoughts to your way. We ask for healing for those that are hurting and suffering in these difficult times. Thank you for the doctors and the scientists that are developing treatments for this virus. Dear Lord, help us to be mindful this week of those in our number that have needs so that we can help and maybe return them to our assembly. We ask that you be with those that lead us in our congregation. Please give them good health and ability to lead. We ask for forgiveness for our sinful actions. Make us aware so we won't continue them. As we continue this service, turn our minds to you and away from the world's cares and concerns. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. For me, it's the right time to add on a, a new song. And especially for this song, I think it's important that I tell you briefly what it's about, because that will speed up our common purpose of singing with understanding and singing from the heart. Actually, this song is pretty easy to learn. The first two verses are straightforward. Jesus, the cross, what it accomplished, and the exclamation, hallelujah for the cross. The third verse, that's the one that's solemn. That's the one that's powerful. It reads, and when I breathe my final breath, I'll have no need to fear that rest. This hope will guide me into death. Hallelujah for the cross.
Children's Church, so if you have any children ages 3 to 6, you are dismissed at this time. In September of this year, Walt Disney Studios released their live-action version of the movie Mulan. Now, while many of us may remember the animated version, which was released in 1998, Disney chose a somewhat different storyline from 22 years ago. Now, the premise of the movie is still the same, though it more closely follows the Chinese folklore story, The Ballad of Mulan. And I'll try my best not to give away too many spoilers. Hua Mulan is an overly active girl who grows up in Imperial China. While this certainly would be acceptable in our egalitarian culture of today, Pushing such berries, barriers at that time would bring scorn to the individual and shame to the family. And as a result, her father, who was a decorated war hero, continued to suppress Mulan's desire and ultimately encouraged her to spend less time riding horses and shooting bows and arrows and more time learning proper tea room etiquette. As the drama unfolds inside the house, trouble is lurking outside. Soon Mulan's village learns that the roaring warriors have invaded China and the emperor has issued a decree that every family provide one male who can help contribute in the fight and defend China. While Mulan's father has already fought in a previous war and brought great honor to the family, a physical disability limits his ability not only to attack others, but even just to defend himself. Nonetheless, because he is the only male in the family, he chooses to join the men less than half his age and fight for his country. And there's this very poignant scene the night before he is to leave and join the army in which he talks to his daughter Mulan about honor and about respect and about making sacrifices for other people. But Mulan cannot bear to watch her decrepit father sacrifice himself when she believes that she has the ability to fight both for her family and her country. And so in the middle of the night, Mulan takes her father's horse and his sword and his armor and his place in the military. But she must disguise herself so no one can know that she's not a male. While Mulan excels in every way in her training, she is ultimately exposed and therefore brings shame upon her family. Now, without giving too much of the story away, Mulan does not become the hero that the army commander wanted, but instead she is the heroine. Ultimately, she is recognized 
by her commander and the emperor himself for her bravery, for her honor, and her sacrifice. And in some ways, the story is really over. It achieved everything that Hua Mulan wanted. She proved that gender was not a barrier that would prevent her from contributing to and sacrificing for her country and her family. She has proven that the outdated gender roles of Imperial China was antiquated. She gained the respect of her peers and of her general. But there's one loose end that needed to be tied up. Would her family, would her village, would her father accept her for who she is? Not a soft-spoken, mild-mannered young lady, but a mighty warrior who would sacrifice and fight to protect others. It's a great movie, and I encourage you to watch it, but it leads to one really big question. Can we follow our dreams and still return home? Will our successes in life bring us back, will bring us honor to our home, or will our exploits in the far country bring us shame to the family? When we talk about the life of Jesus, we often focus on the DBR. You know the DBR, right? When we talk about Jesus, I heard somebody say it. His death, burial, and resurrection. That's the big part about Jesus. And depending on your thought, theology, most of us really skip over the burial and we focus in on the other two. Some of us seem to train in on the sacrifice of Jesus and we make the cross the center of our attention. Others of us like to focus on the victory of Jesus and we turn the spotlight to the empty tomb. But the fact is, all three are vital to the mission of Jesus. His death made him the sacrifice for all sins, for all people, for all time. His burial not only proved the previous that he in fact was dead, but it also fulfilled scriptures that was prophesied about him long ago. It challenged the faithful. And it demonstrated that Jesus would take on death and hell and Satan. And he would do it in our place. It was the punishment that was allotted for each one of us. The death we deserved. The eternity we would spend. And the pain that we, we would endure. He endured for us. And His resurrection... His resurrection proved that his sacrifice was greater than our sin, that, his, that eternity was better than hell, and that his power was greater than Satan. Jesus beat Rome. He conquered death and he triumphed over evil. Sure, it really was not the way that any of us would have scripted it. And it certainly didn't match the plans of his followers. They had other ways in which he would be the king. Other ways in which he could prove his power and his love. No one thought that a cross would be a part of the king's plan. 
But that's what Jesus chose. And in doing so, he didn't just win for Israel. He won for the world. Not for a group of people living in a small country that was oppressed by Rome. But for all people, all times, who were oppressed under the weight of sin. That's what Jesus did. His death and his burial and his resurrection proves that and that's usually where we end the story but that's not the end Jesus proved so much by his death and his burial and his resurrection he was the hero who proved that humility was greater than arrogance that sacrifice is greater than selfishness and that love is greater than hate. But the question asked of Wa Mulan had to be asked of Jesus. Did he succeed on earth? Absolutely. But did the words and the actions, the sacrifice, and the death of Jesus bring honor to his father or shame to his home? Could a son who carried every sin be welcomed back into the gates of heaven? Jesus became the liar. Jesus became the murderer. Jesus became the thief. Is a lying, murdering thief allowed into heaven? He committed adultery. He stole from his parents. He cheated on his taxes. He screamed at his wife. He told vulgar jokes in the break room. He looked at pornography on the phone. True, while Jesus didn't commit those sins, he certainly bore the consequences you and I deserved for doing them. Jesus carried those sins, not just sins in general, specifically your sins all of them the little bitty ones that we say don't matter the big ones that we're afraid that anybody else would find out about them the sins that we committed years ago the sins that we commit today and the ones in the future all of those fall on Jesus Jesus taking the words of Paul, is the chief of sinners because he carried all of our sins. He bore the burden of your sins. The nails could hardly hold a man to the cross. But it was the sins that weighed him down was the one who carried all of those sins allowed back home. And this is where it gets really important. And we kind of miss this part. We skip over it because really the Gospels don't pay a lot of attention to it. We get some pretty graphic details about the death of Jesus. What took place? A lot of people, historians, focus on crucifixion and the pain that Jesus went through. Luke was very concerned about making sure his readers understood that Jesus was crucified. He was dead. Medically, there was nothing alive about the Jewish carpenter. Going to such pains to describe the spear 
that was thrust into his side and the blood and water coming out separate. It was the death of Jesus. The burial is found all throughout the Gospels. The fact that he was taken off the cross, that he was confirmed dead by the centurion, that Joseph and Nicodemus did in fact place him in the tomb and a large heavy stone was placed in front of it. And later there would be a seal placed on that stone to make sure that everybody knew, knew that Jesus was dead and he was buried and he was on the other side of that stone. And of course, as we looked at last week, the resurrection is mentioned in every gospel from multiple different witnesses. We have Mary and the women who were going there. We have John and Peter running to the tomb. We have Mary questioning the gardener. We have Cleopas and his friend on the way to Emmaus. We have the apostles in the room, Sands, Thomas, and later with Thomas, verifying that Jesus not only died, not only was buried, but he was resurrected. We even have Jesus eating fish on the shore with his followers. But very little attention is given to this last part that Jesus does. And that's his ascension. And it begs the question, was Jesus allowed back into heaven? Did Jesus just go off on his own? Did God plan to have his son Trapped, charged, convicted, and crucified. Did Jesus go rogue? Did he just make it up or decide he was going to do something different? Was God pleased with the actions of his son? Did it happen the way it was supposed to? Or maybe Jesus made a mistake. Maybe that last bit wasn't supposed to happen. The ascension tells us otherwise. Was Jesus' sacrifice great enough? Was God's grace big enough? The ascension of Jesus screams yes. His entrance into heaven wasn't just accepted, it was celebrated. Like the prodigal, the father came running, welcoming his son with open arms. I love that because I imagine it was Jesus' open arms that welcomed us into the family. And it was the open arms of God that welcomed Jesus back home. The ascension is important. It shows us that Jesus came and did exactly what his father called him to do. To choose followers who were unworthy. To perform miracles that would be questioned and ignored. To offer himself as a sacrifice as people screamed out words of hate. And to die on a cross as a criminal while people bet on the clothes that he had worn. This was all a part of God's plan. And the ascension reminds us all that the grace of God is big enough. And the sacrifice of Jesus, it was enough. And it just leads me to ask one last question. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a song of invitation and encouragement. 
And as we stand and sing, I want you to think about this question. If heaven can welcome in the one who bore all of our sins, what does that mean for you and me? Let's stand and sing this morning. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing cloud? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood? Thank you, Doug, for a very nice message. A um, few things here today. Uh, I'd like for you to look at the prayer list. There's a lot of folks on that prayer list, and there's some people that are uh, have the virus. There's some people that have other problems. There's people that have both problems. Um, so just look over that list and pray for these people uh, that are... Um, isolated and, and, and uh, have all these health concerns and worldly concerns and uh, the list there's a lot of people that's not on this list that are that need your prayers so just uh, be in thought for those in our congregation that, that may need you and, and uh, pray for them this week uh, the Contributions that were made for the uh, children's home, um, we had set out a goal of $6,000. We wound up with a total raise of $8,630. You're a great and, and generous congregation. And, and uh, just to let you know a little bit about what where that money went and what it was going to be for, uh, Every child at the children's home got a gift card. Uh, since we're not able to go up there and do our normal thing of bringing presents and so forth, they got a gift card. All the house parents got a gift card. All the single parents got a gift card. Every uh, cottage got a $400 gift card for the cottage so that they could buy things that they would like to have, need to have, that funds aren't available for. So you've been very generous to the children's home, and, and I know that uh, they're very thankful and appreciative of, of your, your generosity, and so thank you for all that.
you'll bow with me, uh, we'll have a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be able to uh, get together and, uh, and worship you, and we're thankful to be able to have folks that aren't able to be here uh, participate and be part of our service from home, and uh, we're thankful for those folks, and, and they're a very important part of our uh, congregation and our church. And, and Lord, our nation is going through a really tough time, and I just, sometimes we don't understand the, we don't understand what your will is for this nation, and so I just ask you, Lord, to help us to find the path that you want us to be on. I ask you, Lord, to uh, direct us in the ways that we should think about the things that are happening in this in this nation, and I ask you to guide us as to how we respond to these things and how we speak to our neighbors and our friends and, and people who don't necessarily see things the way we do. And uh, this is very hard for us, Lord, some of us to uh, figure out what the right thing to do is. And so we just have to depend on you to and to lean on you so that you will help us through these hard times. And, and Lord, I pray for all the folks that we have that are sick and and in the hospital and in rehab and having surgery and suffering from the virus and trying to get over it and trying to figure out what to do. Lord, we, those, we all need you. We need you more today than we ever do. And uh, we just need you to uh, comfort us and to encourage us. And, and Lord, we ask you to, to help us figure out ways to be encouraged in our faith is, is things that we see in this world today challenge us. It seems that we see sin and corruption everywhere we go, everywhere we look. And we just ask you, Lord, to help us and to be with us and to encourage us and, and to make us stronger, help us to find out a way to come through this tough time and have a stronger faith than we ever did rather than less. So we're thankful for all you've blessed us with, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.
Good morning. I've got to start out by saying, God is good. God is good. As I was putting my thoughts together for today, I had three paths that I was working on, thinking about, trying to decide which direction that I wanted to go. And I have to tell you, as Doug was giving his sermon today, I got chills, literally. I feel like it was my job today to come up here and put the exclamation point Mm -hmm. on Doug's sermon today. God is so good, and I promise, typically communion presiders, we, we don't coordinate with Doug or the song leaders or anything like that. So when these kind of moments happen, it's just, it's awesome. It's awesome. So my thoughts as we prepare for communion today, God's perfect plan of salvation. And I wanted to give it a little twist because we're less than two weeks from Christmas. But my title is The Gift. The gift. Thoughts of communion often turn to the physical sufferings of Christ. If you've read or seen one of those physicians' account of death by crucifixion, you have heard about the pain and agony. Many of you have watched the movie The Passion of the Christ, and the intensity of some of the scenes makes it hard to watch. Of course, the spiritual anguish of the cross is real as well. Jesus was not only nailed to the cross, the Holy One took on all of our sin, nailed by our shame. God's crown of glory was replaced by a crown of thorns, and he took all this on by his choice. He said, This is the kind of God I am. I do this for you to show you the kind of people you can be. Which brings us to the Christmas season. Thoughts of Christmas often focus on the physical settings for the birth of Christ. We love the manger and the shepherds of the field, and rightly so. We love these images for many reasons but we do not overlook the spiritual realities of the birth of Christ. In Luke chapter one, verses 26 through 33, it's the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. 
This is the kind of God I am. In other words, this is the kind of God I am. I do this for you to show you the kind of people you can be. This is the message of the manger. It is the crux of the cross. It is communion and Christmas. The complete physical world, yet also the entire spiritual. A truth that will never end. The reign of God over all life. Your life. And of course, you know yourself, so you ask the question. Me? God did all of this for me? And the answer is, Yes. Right now we take this bread and this cup in the name of this Jesus as a reminder of the cross, of his death and burial and resurrection, and even the meaning of his birth. Not only his birth in Bethlehem, but his birth in our hearts. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity to gather around the communion table with our brothers and sisters. And God, we're just so thankful for your perfect plan of salvation. We're thankful for the gift of Jesus. And as we partake of this bread, we just pray that we do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue this time around the table, God, we're just so thankful for this cup, which represents the blood of Jesus washing away our sins. And once again, God, we are just so thankful for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. We're so thankful for your perfect plan. And as we partake of this cup, we pray that we'll do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to take the offering today, as you all know by now, we've been doing this long enough. Those of you who are in the auditorium have an opportunity to leave your offering in the box in the back as you leave. And those of you at home, we're thankful for you and you have the opportunity to mail in a check, have uh, somebody come by from the church to pick it up from you, or certainly be able to do that online as well. So pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, God, for life and for the opportunities that you give us, the blessings that we enjoy. And God, as we take this time to reflect on all of that, we just pray that as we give back a portion that uh, is yours, God, we just pray that we would do so with joyful hearts. We pray that this money would be used to further your kingdom, and we're just thankful for the opportunity to be able to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 